Thanks, Rashmi. So I, I have to say I was a little bit intimidated to come and talk to everybody today because this is such a knowledgeable group and I didn't really know where to start. So if I sound like it's too simplistic in the beginning, I promise I'll get to some more interesting stuff. And if I talk way beyond, we can, we can dial it back. Just let me know. So I'm going to talk about infections and diagnosis. I'm going to talk about the impact of immunosuppressives on infection, specifically um, with biologics. I'm also going to talk about infection and inflammation, which I think is one of the things that we struggle the most with, um, and finding the balance between that, knowing that infection has impacts on the inflammatory system, um, and also um, inflammatory systems have impact. I'm going to use the lung as a specific example to talk about. So um, these are some photos of different infections. And I think the important point I'm trying to make here is that um, all infections can present very differently. Um, not, n none of these infections are the same thing. Um, and none of them are actually even from the same class of infection. And I think uh, paying close attention to um, what you have to communicate to us as physicians and, and you know, healthcare providers is probably one of the most essential things that helps us take care of your children most effectively. So, you know, no matter if you have, you know, a, bac a bacterial infection, which is the, the one on the side, a fungal infection, um, the top one is actually my child um, who had a really impressive rash, um, and I got this picture from his provider, uh, and uh, you have a um, viral infection. Uh, we really do spend a lot of time thinking about this and trying to help um, diagnose what, you, what your children have so that we can be directed in, in our therapy. Um, how do we do that? We start with a really important history and exam. And I think um, one thing that is particularly important with kids who are, um, have a systemic JIA and other manifestations related to that in MAS is that timing is really important. We need to understand when things started, how they're progressing, what's going on. Um, you really do need to expect a lot of unusual questions from us because um, our minds work in you know, odd ways. And there are certain things that you may not think are Im important, but we really do. It can depend on you know, if you went to the petting zoo um, in the last couple of days or you know, if your family happens to um, do a lot of hunting. So it's a whole breadth of things. And uh, um, we uh, just ask that you be patient and humor us a little bit because sometimes we uncover a a, a nugget that really helps us do the right thing for you and with you. Um, we really want to focus on what the current symptoms are um, that they're experiencing and we really want to hone in on how to approach you and your child so that we don't do things unnecessarily and that we don't um, kind of get off track. We also really need to know about prior events. I think that's something that's really important for um, a practitioner to ask about but also for you to communicate to us, if your child has had a series of events that may or may not seem related to you or may seem very related to you, it's really important for us to know those and understand those because that affects how we think about what's going on. And also, it's really important for us to know all the therapies that have, that have um, been tried, and even if they were last week, last month, um, and what the responses to those were, uh, it, it is a much more intensive interaction sometimes than people are used to. Um, and then what do we do once we do that? Well, there's lots of things that we do, and I think you're probably more familiar with some of the general nonspecific things that we do than, than most people. Um, everyone here certainly had their child's uh, SED rate or CRP tested over and over again. Um, you know, the ferritin level or what it may be. These are all, as you know, fairly nonspecific. And when we're trying to diagnose infection, it's kind of the beginning of the process. And I think that's one thing that we really think about is what are the nonspecific things that can help us kind of gauge where we're starting from. Once we do that, then there's lots of specific things that we can do, but they all, they all have their um, strengths and limitations. And I think that's one of the things I'm, I wanted to communicate is that, you know, there's lots of different types of tests. And if you don't understand what we're trying to get at and what the limitations of some of our testing is, it can be exceptionally frustrating. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, we do things in infectious disease. We look at, you know, serology, which means basically do you have an immunologic response to something? Obviously, those can be um, 
they can help us discriminate a new infection versus an old infection, and they can also, but they can also take some time for a response to develop, and it can be in a window period where we don't actually see a response yet. We do cultures often, you know, I'm sure familiar with blood cultures, sputum cultures, cultures from bronchoscopy. These are um, fairly reliable in many circumstances, but also impacted by the fact that you may be receiving therapies already um, to help suppress an infection uh, that will interfere with our ability to recover it through a culture. And this can take many, many days. And in fact, some of the cultures, um, as many of you know, will take even weeks. Um, and that can be a really hard waiting period. Uh, we also, there are many rapid tests. Your child comes in, we think they have the flu. You can know in 20 minutes. Um, but those tests aren't always 100% accurate. You can have false positives and false negatives, and that's something that you have to work with your teams to help understand. Uh, we also have you know, more specific tests, molecular diagnostics or PCRs, and those actually can help us detect things very quickly um, and, and at a lower level than we might not normally be able to, but they also can detect things that aren't active, um, that are just remnants of DNA that are in a space that we're testing. And so you have to help us um, understand how to put that into context with what's going on. And now there's the development of newer things like next generation sequencing, cell-free DNA, which are broad panels that can diagnose thousands of infections in a single blood draw. Um, and we have tried to use these. I think that this is something that we're just learning how to use better. And I think that this is something that um, may be something in the future that we'll be able to gravitate toward. But certainly, we don't have all the information on how to interpret these well. So I think uh, patience and understanding when it comes, when it comes to um, these tests. Now, what's the impact of therapy? I know there were some questions earlier, and I'm sure I'll get some more of them. Um, but I think I'll start with steroids, since every, I think everyone here has touched steroids. Uh, you know, certainly they're used for autoimmune diseases, as well as neoplastic and allergic diseases. What do they do to the immune system? Well, they decrease your white blood cells um, that are in active circulation. You can have a transient increase in them um, when you get your first few doses. That's caused by something called demarginalization. Um, and everyone will say, oh, the white count went up because of the steroids. But eventually, it actually decreases the number of white cells that you have. It also inhibits the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is why patients with SJA are given them. And it re reduces the number of cells that you have that actually present what we call antigens. So these are the things that are recognized as non-self and that allow your immune system to learn to get rid of things. Um, infection is mediated by the more steroids you take, the longer you take them, and if you take them with multiple other drugs that also suppress the immune system. So this is just one, one piece of the puzzle. We know that patients on steroids get more bacterial infections, especially when they're having surgical surgery. And if you use them for extended periods of time, your risk of having other unusual infections increases, including having things like mycobacterial infections. Um, certainly, you can have yeast infections and, um, and invasive infections with other molds, but that's um, much less common. And certainly, we also know that there, this is, increases your risk for having certain viral infections. And these are viral infections like the herpes viruses, which most of us have had. Um, about 50% of people walking around have had a, a herpes virus infection related to herpes simplex virus, a cold sore. Um, and generally, it's not a problem. But in kids who are on steroids, certainly the risk of having more symptoms related to that and having it recur are increased. Now, what about the other biologics? Well, you know um, many of you have, have had uh, your children on these drugs. They're um, used. Um, to treat JI and MIS. Um, certainly, I think the important thing here is that we see increased infections. And unfortunately, the number of studies that we have in pediatrics is fairly limited for each of these biologics. Um, but the important thing is that the majority of things that are reported really are things that we see commonly. The, urinary, the upper respiratory infection infections, the nasopharyngitis, the pneumonias, those are things that are very, very common, and they seem to happen a little with increased frequency in patients who are on these medications, but they don't seem to get much, much worse. There are some unusual infections that have been reported. Most of them are actually related to, um, to 
um, specific defects um, or specific exposures. Blastomycosis is a very rare fungal um, infection that you get from the soil, and it certainly happens really in the Ohio Valley area. Um, we don't see it other places. The, uh, this is true for all of the other um, targeted biologics that are a little bit less commonly used, but certainly emerging. Um, and these are things like bacterial infections, viral infections, and respiratory infections. I think that this is something that's important to understand that, that while these associations have, and reports have been made, we're still learning about these. And we certainly don't have all the answers when it comes to what specific infections patients are likely to get or how, or how they're likely to handle them. Um, and I think that uh, the most important thing is that when we're using these is that, you know, we're reporting them so that we can actually learn from them and help other people in the future. I'm going to focus a little bit on the lung. So these are the common things that we see with respiratory infections in children. Um, most of you have probably heard of most of these, things like pneumococcus. Your children get a vaccine when their baby is related to trying to prevent these, that infection, and other ones like Haemophilus influenza. Um, and some we don't have vaccines for, like group A strep or strep throat. Certainly, we see viral infections, and that's the long, long laundry list of things that can cause respiratory symptoms. Um, and then there's also um, opportunistic infections that are increased when you're on certain biologic um, anti-inflammatory anti, uh, um, targeted medications, specifically patients who are on medications that suppress their T cells um, or their adaptive immunity and their risk for PJP. And some of you may be on prophylactic antibiotics because of some of the medications that your children are taking. So what do we do? Well, we have lots of ways to do these diagnoses. And I, as I said, none of them are, are 100%. Um, we, uh, it's important to realize that sometimes we do multiple different types of tests in order to make a single diagnosis. And that's because, as you can see here, not one type of test will diagnose every type of illness. And so um, it may seem like we're um, shooting in the dark, but we're really trying to um, cover um, all the likely possible um, uh, potential infections. I, and I think this is, this is why Rashmi really asked me to come talk, because this is something that we often struggle with is, what's the difference between, what is the impact of infection on inflammation, and why is it so hard for us to tell the difference between these two entities, which are commonly coexisting? So I'm going to start with a viral infection as an example, and there's our little virus there, and it's uh, going to travel down and live in the lung. And it's there hanging out, and it uh, does a couple of things. It infects what we call the respiratory epithelium. So these are the cells that line the airways. It stimulates innate immunity. And then over time, it activates the adaptive immunity. And I'm glad that uh, earlier today someone talked about the difference between innate immunity and adaptive immunity, because the innate immunity obviously is what keeps keeps us alive immediately. So that's why, you know, we don't all, when we brush our teeth, get bacteria in our blood and, you know, fall over um, because we have bacteria in our blood. The innate immunity grabs that bacteria directly out of the system and prevents it from making us ill. But these all interact with one another to specifically affect the lung. So what happens? The, viral, the virus is um, taken up into the epithelial cell, and it increases the amount of secretions and human beta defenses, which are part of the um, innate immune system. It also increases the um, secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and some of them you'll recognize very readily, IL-6, um, um, maybe MIP-1A. These cause are called chemotractants. So what they do is they are basically um, the forebearers of uh, a, a megaphone. They call out to all the other cells that need to come in and help clean up whatever this pathogen is that's affecting the lung tissue. And it calls them to come in and infiltrate so that they can try to control this um, invader. And then macrophages, as you know, will come in and they will secrete more pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-6 and TNF-alpha. And then other cytokines are stimulated and create basically a lot of inflammation. So not only could you have ongoing inflammation from an underlying disease, but also the pathogen that comes in, this invader, is going to stir everything else up in order to try to get your, the immune system to kick the invader out. So the innate immune system 
comes in when this, and it produces these pathogens. It calls in neutrophils. You develop nitric oxide. Um, it, this gets um, cleaved, and you make more. You call in some eosinophils. You call in more pro-inflammatory cytokines, which calls in another type of cell. And then you have some beta defensins in there, and these cause a positive feedback loop. So basically what you have is just a big hot mess. Everyone's getting excited and everyone, you know, how do you turn this off? You have to get the adaptive immunity in there to help recognize specific cells. It's going to also cause the system to create a cascade of inflammatory markers to help regulate so it can extract the pathogen and also improve the milieu in general. Now, when you're already on medications that block some of these pathways, understanding how that's going to impact an individual patient is very difficult. What's the outcome of all of this? Well, the inflammatory cells come in, they produce further inflammation, they have reactions with interferon gamma, there's direct damage to the epithelial cells, and this is mediated by the viral replication itself. It also stimulates the immune system, as we talked about, and it also can cause something that we've noticed, specifically in patients who have lung transplants and lung grafts, is that it may expose what we're called cryptic autoantigens. So basically, our body is trained to recognize what we are, our self, from what we aren't, our non-self. And there are some parts of our self that are always hidden. They live underneath something, and they're never exposed. So when you're developing in utero, you don't learn to recognize that at all as yourself. And so sometimes when these get exposed through, through injury related to infection or other mechanisms, it may expose these. And you can create ongoing inflammation related to the development of what we call autoantibodies that are specific to an event. Um, and this is something that's currently under investigation. It's certainly not the driving factor of all the inflammation, everything that's going on, but it may be related to why we can see recurrent episodes, or it may be a result of the current episodes. And that's something that, um, at least in lung transplant patients, we still are investigating, and it's in the very early stages of evaluation. And I'm going to use lung transplant as an example, since that's what I'm most familiar with. So basically, patients develop chronic allograft dysfunction or chronic lung disease related to um, this lung injury. And it may be related to certain effects of infection. So there's an injury to the lung. Obviously, we saw the, all these um, alphabet soup of inflammatory markers that come in. And then the body starts to repair, because that's what the body does, and that's what it's good at. Um, and there's two ways it can go. It can resolve, and the function can be restored to normal. Um, unfortunately, sometimes there's ongoing injury. And there's remodeling, and this creates chronic lung disease. And so um, understanding the differentiation of why some patients go to resolution versus go to remodeling is something that's an ongoing area of research. And I think it's important um, for us to understand that uh, we don't know all of the triggers that, that fit into that. And we don't, know the, we don't know how this applies to other acute lung injuries that occur. So what are the implications when a patient has an acute event and acute symptoms? So I see this as a balancing act. And I know that um, uh, many of us have struggled with this, um, this balance. So the implications of infection really are that you have an immunologic response at the onset of an infection. And the duration of that immunologic response to the infection to try to eliminate the infection um, can go on for an extended period of time because the immune system is already being modified by the therapies that a patient is receiving. And these therapies may be um, short, short term. You could stop them, and it would, they, it would get better. Um, or they may be long term, that they have turned off a certain set of signals, or they may be stick around for a long period of time and may have difficulty turning them off. But then there's also the post-infectious the post inflammation that can still occur. And the balance between these two things can be very difficult. Um, it also can be that perhaps the body isn't very good at that. You saw the positive feedback loop that we have. And sometimes additional immunosuppression may be actually needed during the course of an infection in order to help turn the body, turn down, dial down that set of inflammation to make it so that, so that the body can actually um, eliminate the infection, but 
hopefully not move toward the idea of having the chronic lung injury. So in summary, I know I covered a lot of ground, but um, infection is specifically very common. Lung infections are exceptionally common in patients who are on biologics. Um, the more biologics you are on, um, and especially, especially the ones that are less specific, like steroids, um, also um, increase the risk of infection. And infection and inflammation are certainly intertwined. The balance is very disrupted um, during this process, and distinguishing where to intervene can be very difficult, but addressing the balance is something that we all need to appreciate so that we can try to find the right place for each child. Thanks. We only have time for maybe one quick question. Over here. So actually I have a two-part question, but it's, I think, fairly quick. So we in the group, as well as with my own child, um, have seen frequent cellulitis. Is that something that should be expected in children that are on immunosuppressants? Yeah, so um, there are a couple of, there are, so certainly that has been reported. Increased risk of having cellulitis is certainly one of the things that patients who are on biologics can get. Um, and there's probably, there's probably in conjunction with other, with other um, reasons why the cellulitis happens more, you know, in general. Cellulitis is probably one of the most common pediatric infections that we see. Um, and we often see patients, once they have an episode of cellulitis, that they can get another one. It, it has, usually is multifactorial. And you could probably work with your um, general, you know, pediatrician to work on kind of some of the tricks of the trade to try to decrease the um, frequency. Um, and I'm happy to talk with you individually about that after. There's, there's so, a couple of things that we commonly recommend that might that might help at least reduce the burden of that. Okay, thankfully in our case, I think we've kind of gotten a control at this point, but it was a problem. We've definitely noticed yeah. other parents mention it. But to piggyback on that question, in our case, as well as many of our kids, um, they're often started on like an oral antibiotic and however have to be either on several rounds of antibiotics, or in our case, our son has been hospitalized and put on IV, multiple IVs of different antibiotics in order to clear up not only cellulitis, but some just kind of common infections. Is that common also in kids to expect just that general need of multiple rounds of antibiotics? Um, I think that's, I think that that is not a blanket, um, a blanket statement, but I do think that certainly, you know, being on multiple different therapies and having a suppressed immune system puts you at risk for more common events and them happening more commonly. I think one of the things that we struggle with as pediatricians in infectious disease is that, you know, oftentimes, oftentimes um, we see the things that are common just happening more frequently. And then we have a population of patients that get unusual things. And I think distinguishing the two of those to try to come up with plans of how to, of how to you know, deal with them is something that you have to think about as well. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, oftentimes if someone has something like cellulitis or pneumonia, there's lots of different choices of antibiotics, and they each have their, you know, benefits and their drawbacks, and they each have their kind of spectrum of what works for one person versus another person sometimes. And I think sometimes it's that we're just not able to definitively say that this is the specific bacteria. Unless we get a culture and it grows and we're able to, that this is a specific bacteria that's going to work right now. And I think some of it is a little bit of trial and error, and that's just, you know, we see that in kids who, um, who aren't on immunosuppression too, um, but uh, I think we see it a little bit more frequently because you have more, event, more episodes. Sure. Thank you so much. And I think next 